Well, good morning, everyone. It is good to see you also all online, wherever you are across America, around the world, really. Thank you for joining us at Prestonwood Live and to everyone in the room. It is so good to see you. Uh, last week was good in that we were able to keep church going uh, online, but I sure miss you and miss being together. It's great to have the choir back and our orchestra, and uh, you're going to be seeing them uh, regularly going forward as we are uh, gathering and regathering everyone. Uh, but uh, that's a new song I haven't uh, heard, but it reminds me of an old one that we used to sing when it said, uh, God cannot fail. It says, uh, God can do anything but fail. That's an old one. Uh, he can save, he can keep, he can cleanse, and he will. God can do anything but fail. We have a great, great God. And so take your Bibles and turn with me to the first chapter of the book of Romans. We're calling this series The Essential Gospel, and the title of this message is To the World with Love. Well, Super Bowl 55 is in the books. And the Bucks, who would have thought it? The Bucks, the Tampaneer Buccaneers, are champions. And Tom Brady just led to seven Super Bowl wins. I think his third most valuable player. He's 43 years of age. And I think we all have to admit at this point, he's the GOAT. The G-O-A-T, the greatest of all time as far as quarterbacks go maybe even athletes and, and champions. The guy is just unstoppable. He said in the interview after the Super Bowl, he said, I'll be back. So he's coming back again. You just can't stop uh, a great athlete like that. Time will tell. And time ultimately, Father Time does catch up with even the greatest of athletes. But you gotta say Brady's the goat. There is a man in the Bible I believe, who is the GOAT, the greatest of all time Christian. The greatest Christian of all times, in my view, is the Apostle Paul, the greatest Christian who ever lived. And what was the secret of his greatness? What made Paul the man in Christ that he became? The passage that is in front of us today, chapter 1, verses 13 through 16, we see this man bearing his soul, just unleashing his life, showing us what propelled him to keep going and going and going and never stop for the glory of God, the greatness of the gospel. A man who was willing to march off the map to do whatever it takes to get the gospel to the world. He's writing in the book of Romans to, to people, Christians primarily, that he had never met. And yet in keeping with this man's passion and personality, he can't wait to get to Rome, yes, even almighty Rome, to encourage the Christians there, the believers there, and as he would say, to have a harvest among you, to bring, bring more people to Christ. His words in this letter to the Romans were delivered, the very words that we read today, the Word of God that came through the Apostle Paul, breathed through by the Holy Spirit uh, in his life. He wrote this letter from Corinth, and it was delivered most likely, most likely by a woman by the name of Phoebe. If you want a job done, get a woman to do it. And Phoebe <laughs> carried this letter to Rome. And it's all about the gospel. That's why we're calling this the essential gospel. Because there's nothing greater other than God himself than the gospel. There's nothing better. We don't graduate beyond the gospel. The gospel is everything because the message of Jesus is everything. Without the gospel, there's no reason for us uh, to be together. It would be like playing the Super Bowl without a football. Several years ago, coming up to the Christmas Eve service, our candlelight service, 
We had Mark Rylander, a wonderful friend who went on to pastor our North Campus. Uh, he was at that time in charge of the candles of the Christmas Eve service. And we got through the first candle service, candlelight service, and I looked in the boxes and there were no more candles left. They were all gone. I called Rock Rylander aside and gave him the full Ditka treatment. I said, Mark, where are the candles? We can't have a candlelight service without candles. And I said, that would be like showing up to play the Super Bowl without a football. Well, somehow, magically, mysteriously, candles began to appear from every way. I think Mark's entire life passed in front of him uh, at that point. Well, you can't have church without the gospel. The light is out without the gospel. And so we are committed to understanding always the gospel of Christ. And the book of Romans is, you might even call it the gospel according to Paul. Because this is, this is Paul's uh, magnum opus. It is, it is this message that brought the world the message of Jesus, the gospel, which means what? Good news. And so we're going to read in the text, beginning in verse 13 through 16 uh, today. Chapter 1 of Romans, verses 13 through 16. I want you to know, brothers that I've often intended to come to you, but thus far have been prevented. In order that, why? I may reap some harvest or bear fruit among you. He's talking about evangelism here. He's talking about bringing people to faith in Christ, a spiritual harvest, as well as the rest of the Gentiles, meaning the rest of the world. He says in verse 14, I am under obligation. I am indebted both to Greeks and to barbarians, both to the wise and to the foolish. So I am eager, ready to preach the gospel to you also who are at Rome. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. You have in this passage three Magnificent, mighty motivations that move the Apostle Paul and the same motivations seen in three I am statements here will move and motivate us to fulfill our calling and God's commission on us as a church and as individuals, as Christians, to take the gospel to the world. These three affirmations, they are simply put right here in the passage, I am a debtor or I am indebted, I am not ashamed, and I am eager, I am ready. Let's take them one by one. Number one, he said, I am a debtor. Everyone who loves Jesus is overwhelmed with gratitude, a sense of deep indebtedness for the salvation that we have in Christ, that we have been so blessed to receive Christ and his gospel for all that he has done. So we have this debt to pay. Not talking about a debt regarding the law. We're not saved by the law and salvation is free. We are fully saved by Christ and Christ alone, not by good deeds or good works or paying God back in some way. But in the sense of love, not law, but love, our love, the love of Christ compels us, the scripture says, not our love for him, but his love for us, it compels us. For example, as a husband, I love my wife. And because I love her, I have a debt. I have a responsibility and an obligation to serve her. I gotta tell you, after 50 years of marriage, I owe Deb Graham big time. And regarding this matter of the gospel, it is For us, an issue of allegiance and obedience to Christ, who commanded all of his soldiers and witnesses to go into all the world and preach the gospel. It's the great commission. It's not the great suggestion. God has called us all to go into the world and preach this gospel and to make disciples. Jesus said to his uh, disciples in the upper room, He said, 
I have chosen you that you would bear fruit in the world. I have called you. I have commanded you. I have chosen you. This is not something we just have to do. It is something we get to do. Jesus, when calling those first followers, he said, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. If you have followed Jesus, you have this great sense of awe and yes, obligation. The word here can mean obligation. I have an obligation. John Newton, the slave trader who became the dynamic Christian, ultimately a pastor, gave us the great hymn, Amazing Grace. In that hymn, he said, oh, to grace, to grace, how great a debtor. We are indebted. Did you know that it is a sin not to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. We think of sins primarily of things that we do that disobey God. But disobedience also includes those things that we don't do, that we're called to do. And if we're not witnessing, if we're not sharing our faith, then we are living in disobedience to God. That's sin. I read just this week that 80% of American Christians believe They have a responsibility to share their faith. I'm pretty sure if I ask you, do you have a responsibility to share your faith as a Christian, as a follower, you would say, yes, I know I do. And yet, in that same survey, 61% of Christians have not told another person about how to become a Christian uh, in the last year. And for some many years before. So how is it that we know what we ought to do, we affirm it, we say, yes, amen, we're to take the gospel to the world, and yet so many are not doing it. I heard of a uh, a YouTube video by a, a magician, a comedian, by the name of Penn Gillette. Maybe some of you have seen this particular video. Jen Penn Gillette is online. He's pretty well known for, I'm told, his foul mouth and his advocacy of atheism. He is an atheist and proud of it. But in this video, he tells the story of a man who came to one of his uh, shows who met him afterwards and gave him a Bible and shared a Christian witness to this man. And uh, Penn Gillette tells this story with great respect for the man who was willing and come to share with him an atheist, handed him a copy of the New Testament. And although as of now, it apparently has not changed Gillette's mind as to whether or not he would become a Christian or not, here is what he said. It's a profound, poignant statement. He said, how much do you have to hate somebody to believe everlasting life is possible and not tell them that? Because we love Christ and the word of this gospel, the testimony of Jesus, We cannot help but speak of those things that we have seen and we have heard. Therefore, we keep praying and asking God to fill us and use us and take us, if ultimately, to the ends of the earth, wherever he has called us to go. And let me remind you, Preston Wood, that the mission field is right in front of us. I was talking to my friend Mike Goddard. I shared this in the message online last week. I was talking to Mike, who's superintendent of schools up in Lovejoy, deacon at Prestonwood. I was talking to him just about opportunities and obligations that we have to take the gospel to the world. And, And he said it. He said it so simply but so beautifully. He said, yes, the mission field is right in front of us. And we have a debt to pay. I can tell you, I've never been more fired up, more passionate about this gospel and the witness of our church than right here, right now. 
Paul said, this is the power of the gospel to Jews and Gentiles, to Greeks and barbarians, wherever people live, wherever we go, the educated, the uneducated, no one is excluded from this gospel. No one. And who is your neighbor, by the way? I've been, as noted earlier in the service, I've been so thankful as I've been seeing it online and just reports that we're getting of all of our people who have been serving our neighbors in our communities, whether it's shoveling snow or paying. I heard about a, a life group up at our North Campus. Uh, one of the members, a single mom, everything just exploded in her house, destroying water everywhere. And that life group got together. That's a for those of the uninformed yet, that's a Sunday school class. A life group got together, and they went over there. They paid the bills. They cleaned up the house. They bought things for this dear lady. She said, I am so thankful for Preston Wood. And, I am so, and that story is being repeated. And oh, by the way, while I'm on the subject of being indebted and thankful for people, our facilities team, our facility staff here at Preston Wood are the greatest They've been working through this entire storm to get it ready for us to be here today. You look at those clean parking lots, and that includes some volunteers came up here with massive equipment. But I, I just say, you know, when, when, we, when we share love and show love to our neighbor, all in the name of Jesus, for the sake of the gospel, it makes an impact that brings people to Jesus. It's the story that Jesus told about a man who was beaten on the road to Jericho. Beaten to within an inch of his life, bleeding and dying. And the religious crowd passed him on the other side, walked by, pulled up their righteous robes, self-righteous robes, and walked away. And then Jesus said a man who was a Samaritan, a certain Samaritan, came by and he saw the man. He locked eyes. He looked at him. How many times do we just walk by people rather than looking and seeing? He had eyes to see what was right in front of him. And then he had this great heart to feel. It said he had compassion on him, which is love in action, not just feeling it, but like empathy to, to feel with it. It was deep within and he had compassion, and so not only eyes to see and this heart to feel, but hands to reach out. He picked up the man and put him on his animal, carried him to a, a hotel, a hospice place there, and took care of him, paid all the bills. And, and Jesus is illustrating with this well, well-known story what it is to be a neighbor. Because a lawyer came up to him and said, who is my neighbor? Who is it? And the lesson of this great parable is anyone in need is your neighbor. Anyone who needs Jesus, and that's everybody, is your neighbor. It's an obligation. And with the obligation comes this great opportunity to share Christ and the gospel. So we owe him. He owns us. Remember that? We are bond slaves to Christ, like Paul, verse 1. We are owned, and therefore we owe him our devotion and our debt of gratitude. One other quick thing about the indebtedness that we have. We have a debt towards those who have come before us in the faith, to family members and friends and mentors and Fathers in the ministry, O.S., you and I had a father in the ministry, O.S. Hawkins, Fred Swank. We owe that man. And others who walked in front of us, I could go on and on. We owe people who invested sacrificially, financially in these buildings. Many of you in this room have been a part of that, the financial support, the dedication that you have given. So why? so that we could just build buildings and mausoleums to ourselves to die in? No, 
a building to live in, to be a soul-saving station, that we would be a light on this hill to share the gospel around the world. That's why. And we owe the people that are not only around us, but those people who are above us now in heaven, that heavenly witnesses. And one other thing, we owe not only those around us who need Christ and those above us who have gone before us, but we owe those who are ahead of us. Our children and our grandchildren and those we will never meet to make sure we have a debt, an obligation, an opportunity to share this gospel, to pass it on and to pay it forward. That'd be a good place for an amen. He then say, said also, not only am I obligated and indebted, but he said, and let's take it in this order, I am unashamed. I am unashamed, verse 16, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. How so? Paul was never embarrassed. He was always emboldened to share the gospel. Why? What was his confidence? Why this courage to do everything, even to face martyrdom in Rome? To get to Rome, to get anywhere, to get on the next boat and go in the name of Jesus. Why? It, it was Paul was not physically impressive or attractive. According to traditions, and I quote, he was an ugly little man with big beetle brows, a bald spot, and a hooked nose, and poor eyesight, and no great gifts of speech. That was Paul. Though he was brilliant, intellectual giant, trained in the rabbinical schools of Israel, he was a, a powerful intellect, yet personally, physically, visibly, not that much. Maybe an unlikely candidate. Oh, and a former terrorist and murderer. That was Paul. But something happened to this man. You know what it is. He met Jesus. The one of whom the good news says, died on the cross for our sins, rose again on the third day, ascended to the heavenly places, now interceding, praying for us. And one day, one day, pray, one day soon, he's coming again as King of kings and Lord of lords. Jesus met Paul, and Paul surrendered his life and said, Lord, what would you have me to do? And he spent the rest of his days doing what Jesus told him to do. He was not ashamed. Because he, know, he knew the power of the gospel, the power of Jesus personally in his life. How could we possibly be ashamed of Jesus? Jesus is not ashamed of you. He's not ashamed to call you brother, sister. Jesus is not ashamed of you. How could you, we, be ashamed of him? He can take anyone and use anyone who is available to him. Last night I had a wonderful and long conversation uh, with my friend Josh McDowell, who now lives in Southern California. It was my privilege to be Josh and Dottie's pastor uh, oh, for about 10 years, 10 years ago, and we were just reflecting. Uh, he sat right over here, right over. In fact, he mentioned Ken. He said, I sat by Ken Cooper and Millie. And so we were talking, and I was just reviewing in my mind the story of Josh McDowell, who grew up uh, on a farm in um, Michigan, and he went on a search for God. He was asking all those big questions. Who am I, and why am I here, and where am I going? And he tried religion. In high school, he, he said, I was in church 150% of the time. But he said, it wasn't doing anything for me. Maybe it was the church, maybe it was me, I don't know. He said, but I chunked religion. And then he went off to college and, 
he was trying pleasure and, and all the partying and all that. And of course, that doesn't meet, meet your needs. And, and, and then he went, found a group of Christians, real Christians, who shared the faith with him. And he went on a personal search for the reality of the resurrection. He even went to Europe and studied in the great libraries of Europe. He, he came back, his head full, still his heart empty. But one day, he laid his intellectual pride in the dust. He surrendered his life uh, to Jesus. He became a follower of Jesus. He ended up writing 120 books, Evidences for the Christian Faith, including Evidence that Demands a Verdict, which is one of the top 20 all-time uh, read books in Christian history, Evidence that Demands a Verdict, more, uh, more Than a Carpenter. I could go on and on. But here was a guy. He's later explained that he went through some abuse even rape as a child. And yet God raised this guy up out of the cold of Michigan. Now we get it, don't, don't we? Why do those Michigan people act the way they act? They live in this thing all the, all the time. No offense, anybody who's living in Michigan or Minnesota, Mike Perrin, any of you. But I'm saying here, God raised him up. And he's 81 years old now. He said, I feel like I'm 50. He runs every day. He eats right. He loves his wife. He's serving the Lord. And when I, when I got off that phone call, I said, dear God, that's what it's all about. It's not about Josh. It's not about Jack. It's not about you. It's all about Jesus and this gospel. And as long as we are faithful to proclaim this good news of Jesus Christ and keep going, God will use us. Never stop. You say, well, I'm retired. Well, stop it. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. God still has a mission for you. I think of my, you know, Josh now is a Christian celebrity. People know him. But I think of my, uh, you know, Billy Graham died three years ago. Uh, I believe today is the date. And my mother-in-law, Deb's mother, passed away three years ago also in 2018. Of course, Billy Graham won more people to Christ probably than anyone in history preaching around the world. But my little mother-in-law, she witnessed to everyone, not only in this building when people would come in, but when she was in retirement living and under nursing care, she witnessed to every nurse, every doctor while dying, witnessed to everyone uh, in the room, around, rooms around her. So don't tell me your time is done. Don't tell me, well, I'm not a Paul, I'm not a Josh McDowell, I'm not a pastor, I'm not an evangelist, I'm just a nobody. Well, God delights to take nobodies who will tell everybody about a somebody who will save, and his name is Jesus. That's the gospel of Christ. He said, I'm not ashamed because the gospel is powerful unstoppable, even as God himself cannot fail. The gospel cannot fail. You cannot contain it. You can't censor it. You can't cancel it, though people have tried through the generations. Ask Gilberto Corradera, pastor of our Hispanic congregation growing and exploding around the world, not only here in Dallas, Plano area, but all across Latin America, where the online services of Prestonwood Espanol are being watched all over the world. But Alberto grew up in Cuba. His mother was an avid member of the Communist Party. Castro and all the rest, the dictator, the despots, the communists that control Cuba. His father was out of it, an alcoholic, an addict. He had no chance, apparently. But in the plan and the providences of God, the gospel, the good news, got to young Gilberto Corradera in Cuba. And he came to faith in Jesus Christ. He grew as the church in Cuba is now continuing to grow. A friend of mine was over in Cuba and was saying to one of the pastors there, we're praying that all this persecution that you're under, this resistance, that, that it would stop. And the Cuban pastor said, don't pray that. 
Don't pray that. He said, because the persecution is strengthening the resolve of Christians in Cuba. Can't stop the gospel. Tertullian said, the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. The world's fastest growing evangelical movement, the Christian faith, is not in the United States. It's not in Europe for sure. You know where it is? Fastest growing Christian movement in the world. Iran. Iran. Despite government suppression, the Christian faith is growing faster than in all of Europe, Germany, France, and all the rest. We have a program. Our program is on Iran Alive, and through the internet, it's being shared all over Iran. And many people in Iran who realize the emptiness of religion, their religious tradition and Islam, are coming to faith in Jesus Christ. I preached in Germany a couple of years ago, and many of the refugees that had come to Germany uh, we're in a church where I was preaching, and they all came up to me, and they'd been watching our program, and they were thanking us, you, Preston Wood, for sending their pro the program uh, on Iran Alive into Iran because they had family members and friends and loved ones. They were praying that they would know Christ. Can't stop the gospel. Since the communist government expelled Christian missionaries from China in 1953, the church in China has exploded with growth. And even the current opposition and persecution of the church in China right now is that's not working to stop the gospel and to stop the church. Protestant Christianity is the fastest growing faith in China. There are more Christians in China than in France or Germany again. By 2030, there will be more Christians in China than in the United States or any other country in the world. You can't stop the gospel. Amen. Why? It's the power of God to salvation to all who believe. Jews first, also to the Greek, to the whole world. The gospel means that sinners are saved. Saved from what? Death and hell and judgment. Saved from emptiness and loneliness and all the pressures of life. We're saved. Only the gospel can save. Science can't save. Philosophy cannot save. Religion can't save. Psychology can't save. The false idols of pleasure and fame and fortune. None of that saves. Only Jesus saves. And he is the gospel. Never be ashamed of the gospel. Wherever you are, live it, share it. Never deny it, never dilute it. Never be ashamed of it in its simplicity, in its appeal, in its power. Don't compromise the gospel. Don't complicate the gospel. Don't deny it, don't delete it, but declare it. Because it's the power of God. You know, we, we've seen a little bit of the evidence of what power can do in this storm. And just the power of a, of a mighty storm. And, and then, of course, when all the power went out, so many of you were without electricity and power and lights. I was just talking to a sweet family here this morning for four days in their home. And many of you have had the same experience. And when the power goes out, the lights go out. And it gets cold. You know what's happened to so many churches today? No power. No gospel. No power. No Jesus. No power. Just share the gospel. And stand back and see what God can do when you tell somebody this good news that Jesus saves. One last thing, a couple of minutes, I'm landing the plane. Pray that I don't have a crash landing. He said, therefore, in verse 15, I'm ready. I'm eager. 
I'm eager, I'm enthusiastic, I'm excited to share this gospel because it's God's power. Can't wait to go. Can't wait to get up every day, find somebody who needs the love of God. Remember the mission feels right in front of you. Your family, your friends, your neighbors, your work associates, you know that. And it's been said many times, the only ability that God really needs for us is availability. The French Foreign Legion used to have a motto, I'm told, that said, if I falter, push me. If I fall, pick me up. If I retreat, shoot me. (laughs) Unfortunately, a lot of people ought to be shot. Our light is flickering. We're not ready. We're reluctant to share the gospel. Stay ready. When I was trying to play baseball, I would always tell myself, be ready, stay ready. When I'm in the field, whether it was hitting, but especially in the field, I would say to myself, just to psych myself up, I would say, the ball's coming to me. It's coming to me. And then I would say, hit it to me, hit it to me, hit it to me, because it was just building this confidence, you know. If you're out there scared, don't hit it to me, don't hit it to me. Well, let me tell you something. The ball will always find you. (laughs) It will. You know, we're in basketball season now, and, um, you know, shoot the ball. Um, Jackson Shivers, how many shots that you don't take do you make? That would be none. Brilliant Prestonwood Christian Academy coming up on graduation. Good basketball player, too. But you miss all the shots you don't take. You're open. Shoot it. Take it. Make it. Because God has commanded us. God has chosen us. God has called us. I'm indebted. I'm not ashamed. I'm eager. Ready. Put me in, coach. Hit it to me. May God help every one of us to be ready and stay ready to do what God has called us to do. Would you stand with me, please? Everyone standing online, stay with us. This is the time of invitation. I'm going to invite you. Some of you have been listening and you don't know Christ. You're in this room and perhaps someone has shared the love of Jesus with you. Someone has witnessed to you. And now's the time. You know what Jesus said talking about being ashamed of the gospel? He said, if you confess me before men, I will confess you before the Father in heaven. But if you don't confess me before men, if you're ashamed of me, then I will be ashamed of you when I come with my holy angels. Don't be ashamed of Jesus. Don't be afraid right now to make a decision to follow Jesus Christ. So with heads bowed and eyes closed, I want to lead you in a prayer. And in this prayer, you can personally receive Christ by repenting of your sin and receiving Jesus by faith into your life. Ask him, whoever calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice, opens the door, I will come in. He's knocking. This sermon, God's spirit, some friend knocking on your door. That's Christ. Welcome him into your life. He's the King of kings and the Lord of lords. He's your Savior, the one who came to seek and to save the lost. So, Lord Jesus, pray it like this. Lord Jesus, I invite you to be my Savior and my Lord. I believe you died for me and rose again. I confess you and openly follow you. By the power of your Spirit, give me the strength to live for you all the days of my life. And may I then be with you and live with you in heaven forever and ever. You see, every sin can be forgiven. You can repent of your sin, which means to turn around and find forgiveness and healing and hope in Christ. You can be saved, saved today, forgiven Christ in you and heaven in your future when Christ comes again. So I'm going to ask you to come forward. If you've never publicly confessed 
Christ as your Savior, or today's the day when you truly are making that decision for Christ. You may have gone forward in church. You may have been baptized. You may have been into religion, but you have redemption, salvation in Jesus Christ. Do you know Jesus? So come forward today and make that decision. Our ministers are here. Also upstairs, for those of you in the balcony, just go to the person standing in the balcony or right here and say, I'm, I want to trust Christ. I want to make that decision. I'm, I'm, I want to be saved today. There are others who need to join this church. God is calling you. God is leading you to Prestonwood. Come today. Make that decision. Be on mission with us. Be a part of the work of Christ, the witness of Jesus through Preston Wood. Get in with us. This is not a spectator sport, this Christianity mission. It's the call of God. So if God is calling you to come and be with us, accountable with us, responsible with us, we have a debt, don't we? We talked about that. So come and give back and serve the Lord as a member of this church. If you want to rededicate your life, you want to come and kneel and pray for people that are lost without Christ, far from God. Get on your knees. Somebody you know needs to know Jesus. Come and pray for them. For some, it may need, you may need to come and say, God, forgive me because I don't have a burden. I've not been in this battle. God, break my heart for the things that break your heart. Come and kneel and pray. That's how revival begins. And those of you online, just text in 74788. Text in J-E-S-U-S, -S, Jesus, and we're standing by. We have a New Testament we'll give you. We have prayer to offer you. We'll be there for you. Make that decision. We've seen so many come to Christ online in the past 12 months. Make that your decision today as well. Now, Lord, take this time of decision. May your Holy Spirit work in every life responding to you right now. Help them not to be ashamed. Help them not to be afraid, but to now openly, gratefully, gladly follow you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. So come right now. Make your way at, at the, the cross. cross. Come on. You'll be the first. You'll make your way and say, I'm yes, come on. Amen. young man and his dad and his mom come on bring your family and come to Christ just you come to Jesus To those of you who are coming forward, I'm going to ask that you move, please, at this time to my right, your left, and this is celebration, all of heaven and our church. We are celebrating new life in Christ. If you've not been baptized as a believer in Jesus, I would encourage you to be baptized and to be baptized soon. Just contact us here at the church. We'll make arrangements for your baptism. If you're watching online and you want a New Testament, or if you're in the room and you want uh, a Bible, a New Believer's Bible, this is First Steps for New Christians, great study notes. You can go to Guest Central. If you're a guest, we have one of my books, uh, Lord Hear Our Cry, about prayer. You can pick that up. If you want to receive Christ or know more about what it means to take those steps to follow Jesus, go and pick up your New Believer's Bible at Guest Central. It's right in the center of uh, our atrium right there. 
I want us to close this service with a great song. As I watch this snow come down, and I know the storm caused a lot of problems, and still is, and we're on that. Thank God for you people. You're on it, Preston Wood. But you know, when that snow was falling, it was also so beautiful. And I, I just couldn't help but thinking of the wonders of God. There's even the scripture that says the, the snow, as the snow falls from the heavens and the rain and waters the earth and the buds begin to flower, God says, this is Isaiah 55, so will my word not return to me void. Amen. God's word, God's gospel is powerful. You sow those seeds, let God water it. Stand back and watch what God's going to do in your life and in our church. So I've been thinking about the wonders of God and just creation. And so let's sing it. Oh, Lord, my God. Come on, help me. When I in awesome wonder consider all the worlds thy hands have made, I see the stars. I hear the rolling thunder, thy power throughout the universe displayed. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee, how great thou art, how great thou art. Then sings my soul. How great Thou art, how great Thou art. Okay, Michael, sing that last verse, when Christ shall come. When Christ shall come with shout of acclamation and, and take, take me home, what joy shall fill my heart. That's right. Come on. Then I, I shall come. bow in humble and there proclaim my God how great thou art then sings my soul my Savior God to thee how great thou art how great thou art then sings my soul my Savior God to thee how great